Hello, I'm Pastor Kate Stangle. I'm pastor at Hope Community Presbyterian Church here in Virginia, Minnesota. And this is our worship for the fifth Sunday in Lent, and it's for March 21st, 2021. I want to draw your attention to the fact that it was March 22nd in 2020 that we first began filming worship here in the sanctuary, and it's been a whole year. And so I want to thank Mason Crawl for being the one that has helped us get through all this year and for all those readers and helpers that have um, assisted me in worship. But we do celebrate that um, the end is probably coming in, in the future as people are getting vaccinated and we'll probably be able to go back to in-person worship. And so you just keep listening and we'll let you know about that. I do want to um, introduce or tell you that our scripture reader this morning is named Renardo Strotter, and he's a friend of mine, and he's a friend of the church as he's helped to carry groceries in from Ruby's Pantry and whenever I've gone grocery shopping, and he's often been the one to fill the pantry when others have not been available. So I'm happy to introduce him as our scripture reader today. So without, um, well, I do want to remind you then that next week will be Palm Sunday. And so we'll have some special guests for Palm Sunday that we want um, you to be here for. So we welcome you and hope you enjoy the service today. Thank you. Let us call one another to worship as we repeat each phrase from Psalm 119. And Psalm 119 is a long psalm, and every single verse in it has something to do about um, obeying the teachings or the law or the precepts or the path that has been set forth through God. So repeat after me. Be good to me, your servant, so that I may live and obey your teachings. Open my eyes so that I may see the wonderful truths in your law. I am here on earth for just a little while. Do not hide your commands from me. Help me to understand your laws. And I will meditate on your wonderful teachings. I am overcome by sorrow. Strengthen me as you have promised. Keep me from going the wrong way. And in your goodness, teach me your law. Amen. Let us now join together in the opening prayer. Let us pray. Loving and teaching God, we thank you for being with us this day in worship, for challenging us through the words of scripture, for challenging us through the words of songs, for helping us to be there for others as you are there for us. Each person has special prayers on their minds this day, and we would like to be able to share them out loud, and yet 
you do not need us even to share them out loud because you know each of our hearts and the things that we have deep in our hearts that we need your answers for, your help, your healing, your forgiveness. Be with all those who have special needs this day. Speak to them in ways that they can clearly understand you or at least they can sense the power of your presence. The power of your presence is what we need most of all and to have an awareness of that presence. Be with our leaders in the world, in the country, in the state, in our community. Give to them a vision of peace and harmony and love for one another. Help them also to do the hard things and help us to be accepting of their leadership. We pray for those who are sick, for those who have been injured, for those in the hospital, for those recovering at home, for those who experience long days of not feeling better. We pray for them, asking that you might touch them and heal them in spirit and in body. We thank you that we have gotten through this whole year of the COVID virus, and we thank you for the strides that are being made with the vaccinations. We thank you that we have found out we are stronger than we thought we were, and that you have been our strength. Be with us now as we go through this worship service and be with us as we go through the week that is ahead of us as we get ready for Palm Sunday. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. In this reading from the Gospel of John, 
A group of Greeks came seeking Jesus. Jesus predicts his own death and resurrection and makes a deeper analysis of what this means. Through his sacrifice, like a seed planted to grow and bring forth much fruit, a new relationship with God would be established. His crucifixion would draw the whole world into this new relationship with God. Listen for God's word to us through John 12, 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival, some were Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come to you for your sake, not for mine. Now is, the, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the living word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forty-one years ago, on March 24, 1980, Catholic Archbishop Oscar Romero from El Salvador was assassinated while he was conducting mass at a hospital chapel. He is seen by the people in El Salvador as on the same par as Martin Luther King and who was also assassinated for his beliefs and for Nelson Mandela, who was imprisoned for decades due to his beliefs. You see, Oscar Romero, the archbishop, spoke out against poverty, social injustice, assassinations, torture amid a growing war between the left wing and the right wing forces. And he was celebrating mass and was holding up the host when he was shot. And that was 41 years ago, this Wednesday. I had the privilege of traveling with, with a missionary group from the Des Moines Presbytery to go to El Salvador and to visit some of those places. And we went to visit the, the, the hospital chaplain, chapel where Archbishop Romero was assassinated. And we saw the place where his body lay on the floor. And we saw the little place where he lived. It was not very far from the hospital. And we learned a lot about the little country of El Salvador, and we learned a lot about Archbishop Romero. El Salvador is a tiny country about the size of Massachusetts, and it's on the west side of Central America. And it has long been known as being one of the violent, most oppressed regimes for a long time. 
but it's been fighting for democracy, and so the United States has been involved with El Salvador. It's funny that El Salvador, which is a Spanish word, words, means the savior, El Salvador does. And in a, a, they call them homilies instead of sermons in the Catholic Church. In a homily that um, Archbishop Romero delivered the day before he was assassinated, he said, in the name of God, in the name of this suffering people whose cries rise to heaven more loudly each day, I implore you, I beg you, I order you in the name of God, stop the repression. And he was saying this to the police and to the military, asking them to disobey their orders. And it was the very next day that he was assassinated. And his final words of the mass and even the sound of the gunshot are recorded. And we were able to hear all those things as we visited the place where he had lived. Now, when he was made an archbishop, he should have moved up into a finer place to live. But he was a very humble person, and he believed in self-sacrifice and living the simple life like the rest of the people did. And so he stayed in his little tiny rooms that he lived in and did not climb the ladder as many would have done. And just before he was shot, he was preaching on these words that, that Renardo Strader read for us today. He said, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. And after hearing this, this gospel, Archbishop Romero gave a short homily and said, one must not love oneself so much as to avoid getting involved in the risks of life that history demands of us. But whoever out of love for Christ gives themselves to the service of others will live like the grain of wheat that dies. Only in dying does it produce the harvest. Whoever offers their life out of love for Christ and in service for others will live like the seed that dies. Just a few minutes after he spoke these words, Archbishop Romero was dead, shot through the heart by the assassin. We visited his tomb, which is in the San Salvador, the capital of El Salvador, um, the San Salvador Cathedral. And it's down in the basement, and there's a tomb there. And on the wall were painted those words from John 24, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. So why am I spending so much time talking about Archbishop Oscar Romero? He was a Catholic and we're Presbyterians. He was in El Salvador and we're in Virginia, Minnesota. I think we have to look long and hard to find these kind of Christ-like figures here in the United States. Oh, we have them but they are not often as clear as the one who came from the country of El Salvador. And as we come and are celebrating, uh, celebrating is a funny word to use, but observing the 41st year since Archbishop Romero was assassinated, we think of the sacrifices that he was willing to make for his people. And he has since been held up as a saint and as a martyr and as a leader of the people of El Salvador. Some Greeks came to Philip and said, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. 
We have no way of knowing if those Greeks got to see Jesus because it was then that Jesus began speaking these same words that Archbishop Romero had been speaking. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And we know that about a seed, a seed which is planted, a seed which we can hold in our hand, and then which is planted and bears much fruit and becomes much bigger than it was. And those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Lent is that special time in the church year where we really focus on the sacrificial life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was afraid, but he was still dedicated to giving up his life for others. And he encourages us to be people of self-sacrifice. What are some of the ways that we can be self-sacrificing? Well, we can stand up for the Black Lives Matter movement when that is not the popular thing to do. We can have compassion for the law enforcement people who go into every situation not knowing if this will cause them to sacrifice their own lives. We can be self-sacrificing by insisting that the climate change is actually of crisis pr proportions and realizing that God has made all of creation and all of it matters, not just us as human beings. We can take seriously the discrepancy between the rich and the poor as it becomes greater and greater. And that with the COVID pandemic, the world will not be the same. And there are many who are suffering from grief and loss from the death of persons or a person and many are grieving over the loss of their livelihood and of their businesses, their lifestyles, their homes, their finances. I've just started this list of self-sacrificing things that you can do and be part of, and you can finish that list yourselves. The Greeks came and said, we want to see Jesus. We want and need to see Jesus. We want the same thing. We, but we do see Jesus if we only stop and look around. We see Jesus each time we recognize the racism and oppression that people are going through. We see Jesus each time we do one thing to take the climate crisis seriously. We see Jesus each time we fill the food pantry or think lovingly towards those who are there to use it. We see Jesus as we go through our Lenten worship and see the image of Jesus in front of the communion table. When and where did you last see Jesus? I saw Jesus as I was preparing for this sermon and remembering the two trips I made to El Salvador and the times that I learned about Archbishop Oscar Romero. I saw Jesus yesterday when I went through the McDonald's drive through and got to the window to pay. And the clerk said, the person in front of you already paid for your lunch. Stunned, I looked at the white car in front of me and didn't recognize it. But then knowing I was somehow seeing Jesus in front of me and I decided to do the same and to pay for the car behind me and then to give the clerk a tip, which is not so accustomed at McDonald's. I saw Jesus in that clerk. I saw Jesus in that car, yet I never really saw the person's face. And I know it was Jesus that was behind me in the car behind. No, that isn't exactly giving up your life 
for the gospel, but it is a way of practicing self-sacrifice. And as we practice self-sacrifice, we are following Jesus, and we're learning about what it means to give. December 9th through 11th in 2020, in Brainerd, Minnesota, which is um, down by Cross Lake where I go on the weekend sometimes, at a Dairy Queen, there was a drive through and for two and a half days, 900, that's nine zero zero, 900 cars went through and paid it forward for the car behind them. Each car paid for the meal for the people behind them. And when they couldn't pay for the whole meal, they put their money toward the cost of the meal of the person behind them. It was such an unusual event that even Good Morning America had it featured on their morning news program. Those working at the Dairy Queen said that before they'd seen 15 or 20 people go through and pay for the people behind them, but never as many as 900 in two and a half days. Let's face it, the sacrificing that Jesus did was not as much fun as paying it forward at Dairy Queen or McDonald's or filling the little food pantry. But it's because of his self-sacrifice that led him to the cross, to death and ultimately to the resurrection that has saved us all for these days. And what are we saved for? We are saved so that we too may follow Jesus with that path of self-sacrifice. And sometimes it means risking our lives. And sometimes it just means filling the food pantry and talking to those who are in need of it. The Greek said, sir, we want to see Jesus. Look around. He's here. And there, and there. Open our eyes, Lord, for we too want to see Jesus. Amen. Will you please join me in the words of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer which Jesus continues to teach it as we say it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our benediction is from Colossians 3, 17. The words say, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Hey Milo. What? Why are strawberries natural musicians? Why? They love to jam. <laughs> what, uh, what is a pirate's favorite letter of the alphabet? R. No, the C. 
<laughs> what is the tree's favorite beverage? What? Root beer. <laughs> well, what did mama cow say to baby cow? Huh? It's past your bedtime. <laughs> <laughs>